the tech can't be decided by people that know the least about the tech. Yeah. Because then the EU cookie law. <laughs> That's all I can say, really. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Offscript. Today we're going to be talking about AI ethics. Hi, Josh. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, good. It's been a while. It has. It has been a busy summer. It has been very busy. Nice long but holiday weekend as well. Yeah, you had your first wedding anniversary. First wedding anniversary. Which went to the Lake, Lake, Lake District. It looked yeah. amazing. Yeah, it was nice. It's really nice. What did you get up to? Um, I did nothing. It was fantastic. Oh, I like nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't believe it's been a year since you got married. That is incredibly... That went quick mm. and slow at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, I'm finding that with life at the moment. You're kind of in between really fast weeks where nothing kind of is memorable. Yeah. And then years go by. Yeah. So the, the day after we got married, I saw the house that I'm now in on right move. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been all that. Yeah. That took a while. So you've been in that house for six months? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, that was good. Moving the house is fun, isn't it? No, I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll never have to move again, hopefully, if it all goes to plan. That's so it. That's how it works, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to delete right move from Ellie's phone. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. It's whenever you get something new, you start looking for the next new thing. It's human behavior. It's odd, isn't it? Yeah, you get used to that and then yeah. you look at the next you're like, what well, if this yeah. was bigger or if it was had more space for this? And it's like, no, your house is fine. Leave it. Yeah. Just, just enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that's good. Um, and yeah, it's been busy work-wise, hasn't it? You've been doing some events with, with Parallax. Yes, yeah, so we had our second Applied AI event. It was very well attended. Um, the Yeah, the sign-up numbers were really good and attendance figures are good. Mm. It can be a bit hit and miss these days. Yeah. Like... Back in the day, you'd get 80% of the people turn up, and now it's more like 40. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Talking around, well, maybe considering having like a charity donation potentially, so we actually know the numbers. That'd be good, yeah. Because if we want to expand it, we need to know if the venue's big enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's also difficult if you're, um, if you put it on refreshments and things like that. You've you got to know numbers, haven't you? So, um, yeah, I think I think the event that we're talking about is... is you know, amazingly popular. I think it's yeah. having that sort of um, draw for a, for a free event is is amazing in this day and age. So yeah, and you've obviously been organising events for years and years, and mm -hmm. still doing the Hay event, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, done a few less recently because it's been a, a bit bit busy with um, uh, with the work. But no, yeah, I think I think it's amazing the the kind of um, crowd you've got around. You know, AI is a hot topic, obviously, at the moment. Um, everyone wants to learn more about it. So I think you've captured the audience there, which is which is ace. It is. There's a lot of misinformation a lot of people getting overexcited or not excited enough yeah and it's quite easy to yeah go down the wrong road so hopefully we're yeah formative and can back it up with actual empirical evidence and things like that which is yeah. always good yeah it's you know it's a really good speaker panel as well you had you had bethan on uh this one which i think was a second time coming to the event. yeah bethan's great mm. so she's more about around using it for like content marketing and things like that but mm -hmm. she's got very good view of ethical use and making sure you don't overshare data and things like that that's um bethan Vin vincent from open velocity right that's right yeah. yeah and then we had jack sales from ima talk yeah. uh, and that was brilliant it was it was all the fears and hollywoodisms <laughs> yeah um but really well explained and actually some genuine concerns in there and that was quite harrowing yeah clip at the start wasn't there Am amazing slides and everything wasn't it? Yeah. oh the slide design i was i was really jealous i was like <laughs> I, I didn't even put a transition in this <laughs> <laughs> but yeah the, the um that, that opening um video that you showed was was quite, harrowing quite harrowing but powerful about sharing pictures online um but yes mm. it was um particularly stressful for him i think because he his his wife's about to give birth any day now so <laughs> yeah yeah so um so i think he was hoping he wouldn't call mid talk uh, which didn't all worth thinking about um but yeah the the reason that we're doing these events and talking more and more about it is because we're folding it into um products that we're building mm. and we need to think about well especially at the moment because we've got an ai startup which is working in compliance for yep. a large company i don't know how much i can say but basically we need to dot the i's cross the t's mm. and be squeakier than squeaky clean with um ai ethics so this is a really interesting space especially as we see with our new technologies you see that policies and frameworks 
aren't as mature as you'd hope uh, in, in these areas because a lot of it's still being defined the technology is still being quite understood right so i think it's um it's a really interesting space to dig into um your talk specifically on that evening of the event we're mentioning um covered the kind of ethical ai systems and um kind of the frameworks around that which is kind of what we're going to cover today right yeah that's right and, and ethics is it's difficult because it's it, it it's different for every person everyone's got their own measure of what they think is ethical or good um and i started off the talk by sort of explaining that in in a, a basic sort of example so the example i gave is just to like imagine that you woke up today and you decided that you wanted to be an especially good person mm. i mean usually you're quite good but you're <laughs> extra good today yeah um and you see some litter on the floor and you pick it up and pop it in the bin mm. it's good deed number one done nice and then when you're in the shop, you buy the meatless burger because beef's really bad for the environment. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And then the last thing is that you help an old lady across the road to get to where she wants to go. Yeah. But those three things, although you you wanted the outcome to be good, it doesn't necessarily mean that a good thing happens. So that piece of litter that you picked up, the council were going to do that anyway and put it into recycling rather than landfill. Mm -hmm. Um the burger is flown from half across the world, like the Beyond Meat and stuff. Some of those alternatives don't have very good um, environmental impact. Mm -hmm. And the, the example I gave on the <laughs> night was that you've actually helped the woman cross to the three legs and she's hurling racist abuse at people, <laughs> which um, is yeah. probably the, the funnier one. But it, it's just, there's what I'm trying to explain is that you can set out with good intentions, but mm. the outcome it's not determined. Yeah. Like it doesn't mean that the thing that you tried to do has actually worked. Yeah. I think that's an interesting point around kind of trying to be good and having the best of intentions, but maybe not understanding the full context of something, right? Yeah, that's it. And if if you as a company decide that you're gonna have these ways of working to yeah. to, to hopefully change the world in a good way or at least not make it worse. Mm. How are you measuring that? Have you decided that just doing the act itself is enough, or do you need to set some goalposts? Mm. Um, and what the EU reckon is set your goalposts first. It doesn't matter how you set your goalposts, just set them mm. and tell other people, have an external scorecard. And then if you, if you kick the ball and it's not in the goal, <laughs> then you've failed, <laughs> um, basically. Mm. And the reason that they want you to do that is because they know that this is changing so quickly. They can't say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other, mm. because they know it's going to be out of date in six months, less. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they went the complete other way and said, you define what you think is good and ethical, mm. and then you, you hold yourself to account, account on that. And you publish your how you've done, which is um, which is a fair a fair approach considering how fast this technology is evolving, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I think there's a good example. Well, maybe not a good example, but there are examples in in the past where frameworks and legislation in this space has not worked very well, and people might be skeptical, like the EU cookie law and things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see how this is evolving with the kind of consultancy of experts in the industry. Yeah, so EU cookie law, and I didn't talk about it much on the night, but very well-intentioned law mm. to protect the user's privacy, implementation-wise, a complete shit show. Yeah. Because every website owner had to do it themselves, mm. and it's different in every site. There's loads of companies popped up, some of which are more ethical than others, mm. to, to sort of manage cookie compliance. The irony of, of companies actually harvesting more data <laughs> <laughs> through this. It's nuts. Yeah. And obviously Google Analytics doesn't comply with a lot of EU law stuff yeah. and people will leave that on anyway, when, even if you press disallow on the cookie banner. Yeah. Should have been a browser setting Yep, in hindsight. Mm. But is that up to EU lawmakers to decide? Probably not. Mm. So the law can be used as a really blunt instrument and it makes the market do weird things. Um, whereas what should really be happening is companies should be yeah, holding themselves to account. But I mean, I know that's difficult, but it, the, the tech can't be decided by people that know the least about the tech. Yeah. Because then the EU cookie law. <laughs> that's all I can say, really. <laughs> yeah, it, it is tricky getting companies to decide their own, what they should abide by. Um, 
And there's people on both sides of the fence around heavy regulation. Mm. So open AI themselves want the industry to be regulated. The cynic part of me thinks that's because it's going to serve their own purposes because they're going to be best placed yeah. to not only control the conversation with governments, because Sam Altman went and chatted to everyone the other month, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Flew around the world and dazzled everyone with his yeah. blue eyes. Um, <laughs> but he, his company and other large organisations are much better at being able to comply with complex law mm. because they have a whole team of people doing it. Yeah, there's pros and cons, isn't there? Um, it's only natural business acumen to position yourself as a leader and being like, we need a leader. Oh, yeah. look at that. Yeah, <laughs> and we need regulation, but not too much. Yeah. <laughs> and can we decide what it is? <laughs> yeah. Regulation should look like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that seems to suit us just fine. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Mm, I think so. Um, so kind of digging into what you're saying there about those ethical frameworks, what are the kind of different distinct questions that you ask yourself around what, that creating that framework? So the, the, the main question that the EU wants you to ask is, could it negatively impact a person mm. um, in simple terms? And if you, it's not actually too difficult to unpick. Mm. So for example, if it's, yeah, so let's say you're doing some kind of exam and it's important for your career that, that you pass it. Mm. If you used AI to mark that without any human in the loop or human intervention and they just fail and they don't know why, mm. then that would be a disallowed use case. Like, yeah. you know, you can't do that. Um, similarly, applying for a mortgage and um, things like that. It's, it's a real wide net that the EU are casting in terms mm. of what they consider to be AI. Even things like statistical models are within scope now. Mm. So even systems that have been humming along nicely for years mm. are now in scope of this new law. And you might not think of it as AI. Mm. The reason they're doing that is because um, people might be able to skirt around this if it wasn't a wide net. Mm. Um, or you could use AI to train another kind of simpler model, mm. like a statistical model uh, that the, you then use because uh, you can run it more cheaply, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea is... If you're using complex maths that can't be easily explained to decide something, then yeah. you, you're you're in this in this bucket basically, right? Um, which kind of makes sense, um, like because simple SQL query to filter people, we could understand it mm -hmm. as you start like using signals against people to to score them for credit worthiness or other things. It gets mm -hmm. more murky, yeah, um, and then yeah on the AI marking a paper side, you don't know if it's if it's not past them just because it doesn't understand their writing style because they're from a different ethnic background or English mm. isn't their first language or mm. whatever it is. It might just throw the system off. And a lot of this is only as good as the data set that is used to train, right? Yes, yeah. So shit in, shit out. If you just train it on yeah. rubbish, then yeah. So during your, during your talk that you gave, you kind of talked about the kind of questions you'd be asking yourself as a company in terms of, you know, what are we doing? Why are we doing it in terms of what you're implementing with AI and kind of questioning whether there's some way that you can do certain things better. And uh, so can you talk a little bit around that? We're going to get onto ethic, different ethical frameworks shortly, but can you talk a little bit about the kind of questioning around the reasoning of why you'd be using AI at all? Yeah, sure. So most ethical frameworks do seek to, understand what the thing you're doing is um, um yeah why you're doing it if there's something better and why it's better mm. um so it's it's kind of just showing you working really mm. um so trying to figure out let's say the example is i'm marking exam papers but it's actually just um it's actually just a self-help tool mm. so you write down what you're doing well i'm actually just a learning tool to help people in their own development to point them in the right direction mm. why are you doing it well we're doing it to help them out to point um to to make sure that they're what they're doing day to day is kind of correct mm. and then you think around well in the eu regs does that mean i need to add a disclaimer um yes if it's if people are communicating with an ai you mm. just put a little thing this is ai generated some of the information might be factually incorrect you might need to double check your sources 
some of the disclaimers even say might go rogue <laughs> yeah yeah basically <laughs> yeah uh, but as long as you say that yeah people are happy using it they're not using it it's their decision mm. um and you just clearly explain how you're going to use the data it's not rocket science would um, you would you say we're coming out of this murky space where maybe ai has been utilized without people noticing or knowing like you know chatbots were a really good example of this where for a little while they've been used in that yeah, way yeah i think some customer support chatbot stuff has been done using yeah. ai maybe simple ai before yeah. if it could come with a disclaimer that'd be good but most of the time you just want to cancel your sky broadband and you don't really care <laughs> as long as it happens <laughs> yeah. actually rather not talk to a human if i can avoid it yeah mm. um but yeah it, it it's just about putting yourself in that other person's shoes, mm. walking through the risks. What are the, what, what are the edge cases here? Mm -hmm. What is what would happen if an ethnic minority took part in this uh, service design process? Mm -hmm. um, it's just about thinking about all the potential outcomes and making sure you're mitigating against those. Do you see um, specialist consultancies potentially popping up as a result of this? Obviously, you have usually independent consultants for um, things like DNI and and so on. Do you think there's going to be specialist AI consultancies popping up to really help um, bake better ethics into products? I think so. Yeah, I think it's part. It should be part of some of the hats that people are already wearing. Mm. So, if you're a business analyst mm. or you data scientist or whatever everyone should at least put the is this ethical hat on for a bit and contribute to the risk register mm. the risk register is actually quite i find them quite therapeutic they're quite like <laughs> see you put a load of stuff in and then you go away and you have a think and then mm. that sparks more ideas more and more you just put anything that could ever possibly happen in there yeah i, I call it operational therapy yeah <laughs> Because once it's out in the open and everyone's looking at it every stand-up over every mm. week, however often you want to review it, you come up with more and more, mm. and, and you can just score them based on how likely you think it's going to be, yeah. how damaging you think it's going to be, and then you have a total impact score where you multiply the two. There's an interesting side topic on that, which is uh, creating enough psychological safety in your team where people feel they can bring that sort of stuff to the table. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Vulnerability is very important. Yeah. Um, you need to know your own failings and potential weaknesses. Yeah, definitely. Um, like we're building a platform at the moment, and there's a the big screaming risk is that we we're turning fiat currency into crypto assets. Mm. Um, and the regs say, well, that's now you need the, all this KYC process mm. because that could be used for money laundering, tax evasion, mm. all that kind of stuff. It's just mm. nice to get all that stuff out in the open with the client, with the stakeholders, investors, yeah. everyone. Mm. And go, right, what are them? how do we mitigate against this and yeah. step through? It's it's not hard. It's just it's just getting the uncomfortable facts out and on, on the table and, yeah. and just putting a number against them is the first step. Yeah, definitely. It's nice to get all the risks down and, and work through them yeah, and a part of the agile development process is making sure that you tackle the right risks at the right time. Mm. I like to go with the really meaty ones early on. Yeah, um, and yeah, you can do a little bit of that, do some of the mitigation, and then you can lower the you adjust your risk score, and then you have the next one bubble up. Yeah, um, but everyone has to agree that, and yeah, it makes it a lot easier. In, rather than don't just make it one person's responsibility. Yeah, the challenge there is always um, in like a consultancy model or an agency model, you've got the client and the kind of internal team uh, and, and maybe the some of the technical concerns or considerations are not quite as valuable to the client and vice versa, right? Yeah. So it yeah. can be a, a bit of a balancing act in terms of negotiation. Yeah, that's it. And some mitigations actually make the business model unviable as well, so that's a difficult conversation to have. Yeah, I mean, that's... But then I guess that's more about the, the risk appetite of the company um, developing that sort of technology, right? You mentioned earlier in terms of like um, money laundering, for example, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Mm. Um, but yeah, the, the EU regulations, while they're not perfect, this one's pretty good. Um, I mean, I wouldn't recommend reading it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in its entirety if you, if you don't want a good sleep afterwards. But <laughs> yeah, it's good. Um, and it really just boils down to a few simple 
simple things that you need to do. Um, Oxford University's got a really good implementation process called Cap AI, mm -hmm. and you can basically make a lot of the fluffy and ambiguous things measurable and um, mm. actually as a, as a process for going through these things. Mm. So you make a summary data sheet, which is it's basically just an over overarching summary of what it does, what data you used, mm. what its intended use is, uh, performance metrics, what your potential biases or limitations are, um, and then everything from your risk registers to your risk, risks mitigations, and then that basically is all your cards on the table. Like mm. this is this is the AI system that we're building, um, and then the external scorecard is like a distillation of that. So you take the trade secrets out, you take any risks out which might attackers might be able to use, mm. and you just give a high level. This is the purpose. These are the values that we want to hold ourselves to. You do have to talk around the data and how you've how you've got consent for it how you've used it and then you have a governance process which basically says this is the throat to choke <laughs> <laughs> someone needs to put their hands up and go i'm cto of x organization yeah. and i'm responsible for this mm -hmm. um so they're ultimately uh, the person that the eu will come for if they're unhappy <laughs> but that's important as well because they they, yeah. they have to delegate this whole process um, and then the internal review protocol is is basically a set of rules and processes that you're going to use internally to make sure all this happens. Mm. And if you're doing sprint stuff, you'd have it in your sprint review. Yeah. Have we have we examined everything against the mm. risk register? Uh, it, I mean, it all sounds fairly boring, but <laughs> it's like, like it's it's important, though, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I think the. Um the biggest point that you, you've made there really is it, it's, it's not just a framework to define what, what you're doing with the technology. It's, it's around accountability and it's around holding companies to account when things don't go quite right. Um, I think there's a lot of evidence in, in history recently around it being you know abuse happening and then not being accountable bodies. And so really it's just ensuring that, you know, people are accountable for their actions and for the software they're building. Yeah, That's absolutely. Basically it. Yeah. Uh, this is what we said we'd build. This is how it's working. Mm this is a person that's overseeing it all um yeah. yeah it's it's not hard it's just it's sensible really yeah and to be honest it's a really core part of the general due diligence of running a company in that space um especially if you're going to go down the route of funding you know yeah. in, investors are going to be looking for this sort of accountability so 100 percent. yeah um one thing i want to touch on uh which kind of came up in the in the talk you gave was around different um ethical frameworks or, or different kind of mindsets of ethics so you mentioned virtue ethics yeah, um, utilitarian ethics. I'm going to try and get this third one right, but I can't say it right any time. Deontological ethics. Deontological ethics. That's yeah, correct. there we go. Yeah. That's a tongue twister. Yeah, so the, I, I tried to make, because I realised that the, the other talks were going to be quite good. And I, I was like, <laughs> mine's going to just be EU regs. So right at the last minute, I was like, yeah. F word. I'm going to have to just change the start of my talk and just try and describe at least three different types of ethical frameworks so mm. then people don't fall asleep. But I started off with the example of should you punch your friend in the face for no reason? Yeah, I'm and sitting quite close to you right now. You sit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were in the audience and that's... If I said put your hand up, you say think the answer is no, and you didn't put your hand up. <laughs> I, was, I was just I was just fielding the room. For... <laughs> so I had to immediately take a step back. Um, but obviously the answer is no, and instinctively we know it's no. But mm. but the thought experiment I was trying to take people through is like why why is it no? Mm. And the reason it's no is is because of virtue ethics. Or one of the reasons could be. So my example, the reason I gave these examples was to to sort of highlight how you can sort of pick and choose different ethical frameworks. Mm. And that's a bad thing potentially. Um, so virtue ethics is, it, it seeks to discover not what a good person does, but, mm. but rather what makes a person good. So if you were a good runner, you would have strength, endurance and discipline. So mm. those would be three sort of virtues that a person would have yeah. and a good person would have honesty compassion and generosity and you'd need those things in 
exactly the right amount. Because mm. if you had too much of one virtue or not enough, then it goes a bit wrong. So if you had too much bravery, you'd be reckless. Mm. Um, so under virtue ethics, punching your friend in the face is wrong because I can remember you nicked some food off your slice of pizza or something. Mm. Because you, that person doesn't have enough conscientiousness and they've got too much reactionary anger and things like that. So mm. you could score it on that basis. Um, and then it gets more complex when you move to utilitarian ethics, which was, although it's been around for much longer, it was first articulated sort of 19th century. Mm -hmm. So a good act is considered one that does the most good overall or produces the most happiness overall. Mm. So this classic um, trolley problem, so like a train carriage hurtling towards some people, <laughs> and you've got two options where you can... You can you can make it veer off to the side and it kills one person or it can kill the five people that are directly ahead. Mm. And it seems fairly obvious that you would switch tracks and just kill the one person mm. until you start unpicking it a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, because although diverting the trolley results in the most happiness overall, there's, there's five whole families that are going to be more happy, whereas mm. the other way you've only got one unhappy family. Um it's that action that people take mm. um, issue with because doing nothing, under the law, doing nothing might be the best thing mm. um, because the law is not, um, the law doesn't care if you cause the most happiness. Mm. It cares on actions only, Yeah, which is weird. Um, not necessarily weird all the time. In this particular example I gave was like, what if you're one of the people that could potentially die is actually in the carriage with you and they've got the head stuck out the window already mm. and they're looking at the five people ahead <laughs> and you know that if you pushed them out the window, it would stop the carriage in its tracks mm. and save five, five people. Now, on paper, that looks pretty similar to that first problem where we just diverted the trolley and killed the one person. Mm. But in the eyes of the law, pushing that person out onto the track is probably not great. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you did an action and you caused one person instead of five to die. Yeah. So it gets very it gets very hairy at that point. Um and that that sort of brings you on to deontology, which is it's the it's the acts and the rules. So this is very much closer to laws. Mm. Um so it's an ethical framework that thinks that if if a rule is true, it must be true for everyone in every situation. Mm. And um, so lying's always wrong or killing's always wrong. I think most people agree that killing's always wrong. Mm. Um, so it's really tricky. And those three, those that's just three ethical frameworks. And you can see how picking and choosing between those. Mm. Like, let's say you build an AI product and then you, you've already built it and then you choose mm. your ethical framework that you're going to abide by and your goalposts and you set it to because of commercial pressures, we need to get it launched. Mm. Let's set the goalposts where we can kick through. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's always a, a, a worry of retro retrofitting. The scientists know that people do it without realising anyway. Mm. So you need to keep those two. Either you keep them at arm's length and have another set of people decide mm. the boundaries that it must hit. But you need to make sure they're not talking to each other, which is really difficult, which is why you, you reckon if you do it ahead of time, that's more good. You see it quite often in, in courtrooms where you see, you know, maybe like a murderer or something retrofitting their story to, to suit the evidence that's been discovered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think the, the, the trolley um, problem is a really interesting... Depends on how your dinner parties are going, but <laughs> it can be an interesting dinner party conversation because we've all seen the ones where the trolley track um, divides into option A and B, but you don't have the full context. So you might save, you know, in your example, you might save five people's lives to kill one person, but then further down the track on option B, there's a family of 10. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the track loops back round and kills the option A anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and the, the real good example of this was the moral machine which i didn't get onto in my talk but do you remember the it's basically a car a self-driving car and mm. decides who to kill as well mm. and they have some really good you can go through and actually do this we'll put it in the in the notes but it's actually really fun to 
to click through because everyone starts off the same and yeah. then they veer completely yeah. differently towards the end. It's like like an old woman and an old man versus two younger people or one younger person. Mm. It's like, who do you kill? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's proper moral quandary. <laughs> but then, then more human factors come into it, like if you're under pressure and there's time sensitivities and you might make decisions that are, maybe you wouldn't normally make. Um, really interesting tangents around like human nature and decision-making under pressure and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Or, yeah, would it, would it kill, let's say there's a person there and a barrier on the right, mm. would, would you want the self-driving car to career into the person and save yourself or career into the barrier and kill <laughs> kill the owner of the car yeah i mean it probably going to save the owner of the car isn't it mm. um because they're paying for it <laughs> <laughs> but morally is that good yeah probably not which is why this is a great dinner yeah. <laughs> dinner fight conversation um but yeah i mean we'll also you mentioned earlier about the scorecard and some of the different um, kind of artifacts that you get around these sorts of things. We'll also share a link to your slides um, in the show notes as well, because there's some good pointers around the end of the slides um, to those things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's kind of pretty much all, all we wanted to cover on ethics. Is there anything I've missed? No, I just wanted to give a bit of a plug for the white paper that we're, we're doing at the moment, which is seven things to consider when implementing AI in your business. There you go. Um, yeah. How do you sign up? Uh, Parallel.ax slash contact. Fill in the contact form. Say, give me the white paper, please. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll send you it. And it'll go through an AI bot. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then we'll sell your data to someone. <laughs> <laughs> Where it happened, really. Yeah. Happened. Um, also, I don't know if it's a good time to plug Fluency Bot. I know that it's yeah. something you've been working on. Absolutely. So Fluency Bot is a bot that has read all your internal company documentation and you can ask it any question, and it's really good. So it's usually like through something like Slack, you'd, you'd interface with it through a, a chat bot, and it would basically answer questions that you asked instead of you digging through. That's it. So the two main integrations at the moment are Slack and Confluence, and that's our focus area. Mm -hmm. But there is also Teams and SharePoint working, yeah. and it can actually read inside PowerPoints in SharePoint, which is where all company knowledge lives. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, which is really good, although we're still tinkering with that a little bit, but mm. that looks pretty good as well. Confluence search is rubbish, so even if it's just helping you find the right document, it's good, but it's, it's quite good at um, coming up with complex answers to complex questions, which is ace. Nice. Uh, and that's fluencybot.ai, and there's a wait list on there. Wonderful. Well, I've, I've really enjoyed this chat. Um, I think I've learned quite a few things about uh, ethics in AI. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you. All right. Cheers, Josh. See you next time. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Hit subscribe for more podcast episodes in the future. And we'll see you next time.